John is uh, the co-chair of the Rotary Climate Action Team Network. He is one of the most experienced people in Rotary in these topics of uh, environmental sustainability. He is also very involved uh, in the Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group internationally. He was chosen to be one of the uh, five judges of the I Fix the Planet Challenge by the recent president of Rotary. So I let uh, John tell us more about himself. He has so many things to tell us and about a great presentation that I hope will encourage all of us at Bellevue Rotary Club to create an environmental sustainability committee. Thank you very much. John, welcome. Thank you, Maria. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, first, I've got to turn on the sound, which I always forget to do. So I'm assuming that everybody can see that. Um, and I'm very pleased to be with you. Um, and I really do appreciate Maria inviting me and uh, all of you entertaining me. Uh, it's an important discussion. Uh, I'm going to cover an awful lot of material very fast. Uh, but I want to start, believe it or not, with uh, my middle name. My middle name is Grinnell. And I'm lucky enough to be named after my grandfather and my great great uncle George Bird Grinnell. He was the founder of the Audubon Society and father of Glacier National Park. And he inspired me along with a lot of other people in the Boone and Crockett Club that he founded with Teddy Roosevelt. So it's not surprising that the environment has always been an important part of my life. And Grinnell had a glacier in Glacier National Park named after him and it was beautiful. Here it is in 1920 and 2013, and here it is more recently. Something seems to be missing. It used to go almost all the way down to that lower lake. So why am I focused on addressing climate and the issues? I want my kids and their kids to have a world that's not threatened with extinction. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, I assume everybody is muted. Please hold your questions to the end, uh, and we're going to move very quickly. This is the first picture of the Earth fully illuminated that any of us ever saw. It was taken by the last Apollo mission, and it changed the way that humanity thought about our common home. It's called the Blue Marble, and it reminds us that we're all connected and that our actions have an impact on our planet. But let me be really clear, our blue marble, our mother earth is compensating perfectly to sustain herself. Every change in our climate and environment happens within her perfect equilibrium. And she's been in balance for millions of years, she'll be in balance for millions of years. So what's the problem? Perhaps we human beings are the ones that are out of balance. We, not our mother, are at an existential tipping point where we could lose the ability to recover. We're putting 152 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the atmosphere every single day. That pollution, especially carbon dioxide, is building up and it's trapping heat. And we know all the sources of human-caused global warming, but what's important right now is that we're headed for a four degree Celsius increase by 2100, from a current 55 degrees Fahrenheit to 63 degrees. Now here's the issue. Think about it, a five degree difference from today's temperature is an ice age or it's overwhelming flooding. Some people talk about climate change as normal environmental evolution. If that's true, here's what we're going to see in 2100. The yellow and brown represent dry and desert. Billions without foods, water or shelter, massive migration, global economics in tatters, and it may be well too late to slow it down. We're at a tipping point right now. The circles represent the two countries that are gonna be the powerhouses in the future. So every kind of climate related issue is on the rise. We see it all around us and across the world. Severe storms, flooding, fire, drought, glacial melt, tidal rise, ocean acidification, changes in global ocean currents and jet stream. All and much more are happening now. Did you know 25 people become refugees every minute right now? 
and it's certain to impact millions more in the second half of the century. Think about it. California water is now being traded on the CBT as a commodity. We have to make choices now to transition to a sustainable world. But again, we're not moving fast enough as the crisis demands, and mostly due to economic considerations. Here's where we stand today regarding global energy consumption. Oil, coal, gas, the miscellaneous is at hydro at 7%, renewables at 5%, and nuclear at 4%. But we're moving in the wrong direction if we want to address the crisis. The investment for the next few years is expected to be four times more for fossil fuels versus renewables. And the cost of inaction is mounting today and tomorrow. According to the global insurance industry, 2018-19, ranked among the top 10 most expensive overall losses in the history. 160 billion in 2018, 140 billion in 2019, 2020 alone in the United States represented 79 billion. And the future based on mitigation is not attractive in terms of cost and lives. Here are some examples of the cost of an increase in two degrees Celsius. New York, $100 billion. Tokyo, $160 billion. Rio, $150 billion. London, $300 billion. Can countries afford to pay for mitigation and deal with the impact on population? Look at the most susceptible cities at risk by population, many in developing countries that are in grave danger. If parts of these cities become uninhabitable, where will the people go? And how will that impact the cost of adaptation? And who will bear that cost? We're stuck in this feedback loop. Temperatures rise, heat is trapped, temperatures rise. We need to reverse the loop and restore our natural balance. The Dalai Lama and Greta Thunberg recently had a valuable virtual conversation sponsored by the climate emergency feedback loops. The organization has some amazing videos that are worth looking at, and I'll share a link to the website and a bunch of more links uh, in an email to Maria after the meeting. So viewed based on carbon footprint, many countries are out of whack. The average U.S. citizen requires 22 acres to offset the carbon they produce. That's 16 tons of, garbage, of greenhouse gas emissions versus the average global of four tons. Uh, just to put it in perspective, China is number one in as far as emitting, and the U.S. is number two. You see, our climate and our environment, uh, the crisis, is like an overflowing tub. You have to do more than just turn off the faucet. That's the net zero target of the Paris Accord. We need to take three actions. Mitigation, aggressively address the crisis as it arises. Adaptation, find ways to live with shifting environment. We also need to empty the tub from current unsustainable CO2 levels at 420 parts per million and growing to below 300. That means restoration, bringing down CO2 levels through land and ocean sink, natural sequestration. We can't count on technology to do, to need to do it. We need to change the way that we handle our land and oceans. We need to change, and clearly we are changing, Then change is possible. We have the resources and the know-how, solar, wind, nuclear, and things we haven't even thought of. There is enough solar energy reaching Earth every hour to fill all the world's needs for a full year. And did you know that global wind could supply worldwide electricity consumption 40 times over? And did you know that there are many countries where a significant portion of their electric grid is basically greenhouse gas pollution free. Here are a few of them and the percentages that are handled in green, without greenhouse gases. As a matter of fact, you might think this is, this is different, different. Nuclear energy at scale via, via pocket plants with new safety innovations being supported by people like Bill Gates can deliver 4 million times the energy of coal or gas without producing greenhouse gas. It's available and it's happening now. And there are issues. All the costs for existing renewable technologies are falling rapidly. 
and we're beginning to listen to nature and how to restore the planet with sequestering carbon through better management of our forests and replenishing our farmlands and coastlands. At the same time that we're investing in enhancing methods of capturing carbon and sequestration and sequestering it in the ground. The question is, are we willing to manage the transition to a sustainable world? There are three steps to make this transition successful. One, mitigate, adapt, and restore. Accept where we are, take action, and address the costs. Two, shift subsidies. Move quickly to support renewables and find ways to make investments in fossil fuels less attractive. And three, establish a renewable environment, concurrently creating a sustainable future. And we are taking action. The Paris Accord is now at full strength with every nation agreeing to phase down greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by mid-century. That's the good news. The bad news, countries are failing to meet the Paris Accord targets. That is keeping below 1.5 Celsius increase. And they're missing it by a lot. The first 75 countries reporting said that they're going to, in 2030, they're going to get to 0.5% reduction rather than the 45% reduction they agreed to. But news alert, the US has announced that they're going to have a 52% reduction by 2030. And I think we've all heard about that. And climate action isn't just about what countries are doing. We're seeing it in the states, provinces, cities, universities, corporations, and nonprofits committed to reducing emissions. 24 states representing well over half the American people are already going farther than required by the Paris Accord. California, as an example, is taking action with a target of 2030 rather than 2050. Bring it in close, according to Governor Newsom. And multiple US cities have committed to 100% renewable energy. Even though small, there are a few that have already arrived. And some of the world's largest corporations have pledged to reach net zero emissions by mid-century. But it isn't enough. Governments around the world continue to subsidize fossil fuels. Key to shifting our focus is governmental oversight, starting with subsidies and moving on to some kind of carbon pricing. After-tax subsidies have not stopped growing. The last few years have seen increases opening new fields for drilling in the U.S. and Russia, although the U.S. is now shutting down some of those, and building new coal plants in China. China has said that 2040 will be when they stop their efforts in uh, increasing their economy, um, and 2060 will be their target for reductions. Fossil fuels get $6 trillion annually in subsidies. On the other hand, renewable subsidies for innovation and development are only around $1.2 trillion worldwide. And world markets are taking notice. Here's the S&P 500, um, the most commonly used stock index. And it's been going up for the last decade. And here's the energy sector, not a good investment. And the market returns on clean energy sector have gone up 60% in the last four years. Fossil fuel companies, minus 12. And here's the overall value of Exxon Mobil. And here's the value of Tesla just surpassing Exxon. With all the EV competition, a lot of companies will soon surpass Exxon. Fossil fuel companies are now coming to understand that they're facing a real crisis. Recently, Shell and Chevron agreed to a 45% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030. And Exxon board has now taken on several climate activists. But even with these shifts, we have to do more and quickly. Some kind of tax on carbon emission is needed. The IMF, International Monetary Fund, can limit carbon emissions through cap and trade where the government sets limits and companies trade the offsets of their carbon footprint or make money from their green status or a simple tax on carbon emissions based on pollution. California put a price on carbon in 2013. Emissions declined, emissions declined 8%. Today, the program manages 85% of the carbon pollution, the most of any policy in the world, but the system has plenty of slack due to low prices and a high level of pollution permits. The average cost per ton of emissions globally is way too low at around $2 a ton, when it should be more like $35 or $45 to 
to make a difference. And yet 70% of the US voters are fully in support of moving to 100% renewable electricity. We're just not moving fast enough to meet the global targets for 2050. Right now, it looks like we're gonna hit 1.5 within the next four years. We must develop the political will to set the rules of the road for emitters through standards and holding polluters to account. But we can't do it unless we shift our thinking. If you look at the fantastic uh, data that Yale University has put together, uh, perception is in fact reality. Uh, Yale has done a tremendous job of analyzing um, the perceptions of Americans over the last five years. The dark brown means higher level acceptance, the dark blue means lower level of acceptance. What's interesting to me is if you look at it, where is the level of acceptance? So climate change is happening. Average is 72%. It's caused by human. The average is 55%. Will harm us personally. The average is 43%. Most people don't believe it's gonna harm them. Will harm future generations, 71%. We need to regulate CO2, 75%. And Congress needs to do more, 60%. And citizens can do more, 64%. The problem here is that in the last five years, these perceptions have moved very little. And that's kind of scary. With education, perhaps we can balance the demands for, of nature, our blue marble support humankind and rethink what is appropriate growth. But how do we overcome our cultural social instinct to focus on acquisition and ownership that is detrimental to our environment and the most vulnerable among us? Is there a sustainable model that we can consider as we move forward? The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals can provide a roadmap for countries and individuals to support a new way of looking at the world. Did you know, and I'm sure you do, that the only NGO with a seat at the, on the UN General Assembly is Rotary. So clearly people see the issue and they wanna take action. They're demonstrating, they're making demands at the ballot box because legislation and regulation are key to successful transition. But we're still not seeing the rapid shift in economic support for sustainable development. Rotary has joined the growing voices seeking to address the impact. The new area of focus that has been created to support Rotarians is, is available. It's, it's powerful, it's comprehensive. It speaks both to the preservation arm of our environment and di direct confrontation of the climate crisis. Maslow's hierarchy of needs says it all. Climate change impacts those at the bottom of the pyramid. As Rotarians, we cannot continue to say service above self without addressing the impact of the climate crisis on our families, our communities, and those in need who we support every day. The new policy statement speaks to three areas and eight targets. The first group is protecting our environment. The second is taking action amidst the climate crisis. And the third is addressing environmental inequalities. Take the time to read the entire policy statement. It's worth it. It's powerful and comprehensive, and it'll be included in the material that I, that I follow through with Maria on. Many people, including many Rotarians, are concerned that addressing the climate crisis is political. Holger Knack, our, our president this year, said it's definitely not political. It's a fact, which is why it's important. If things are obviously wrong, we have to say so. You are powerful. Rotary is powerful. We're recognized, we're trusted because we can be counted on to get things done. And I know you're already active, but there are three specific ways you can help to make even more of a difference. First, join the growing number of clubs and individuals who have made a commitment to addressing the climate crisis. Our partner, Global Climate Pledge, has over 210 Rotary clubs making the commitment through their website and 275,000 individual pledges. Again, I'll share the link uh, when I send it to Maria. Second, use your position in the community to advocate. 
review your community's clean energy plan if you haven't already based on outcomes. And if there isn't one, help build it. And then take action to support the county plan and they go beyond to the state and to the federal. And third, take on climate projects with community partners. Rotary has the ability to create partnerships in almost any situation. Please recognize your club's unique position and consider how to use it. And there are Rotary resources to help. Through SRAG Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group, we're expanding membership while continuing to focus on key Rotary-wide projects. And RCAT is helping build club infrastructure to focus on community projects and share successes with other clubs. Working together, we support the environment and confront the climate crisis. Use our online resources for information, action, and project success stories. Have different speakers inform you and your club on key issues. Upload your projects to our site so that others can learn of your work. This can be done in 15 minutes using a smartphone. And be sure to join us the third Thursday of every month for the Global Speakers Forum. This month, we're gonna be talking about water. And consider working with the data and ideas from our partner, Project Drawdown. It's a coalition of scientists, researchers, and advisors from all over the world with the goal of providing 100 solutions to reverse global warming. Buy the Drawdown book, download the free Drawdown review, and it'll help direct any actions that you wanna take with your club in the community. Here's just an example of a few of the projects that, are, that you could consider. But let me give you an example of one particular project that is kind of interesting. It's EV Ride Drive. It's important because electric CO2 emissions are almost nil versus gas, hybrid, and hybrid plug-ins. And that always amazes me. Hybrid plug-ins still require a great deal of greenhouse gas. So how would that work? Well, you partner with other Rotary clubs and district rotor actors. You arrange EV sales organizations like Tesla, Ford, GM, or VW, um, or just depend on EV owners. They love to tell their story. Get support from the local government based on the clean energy plan and include other environmental groups. It's fun and it's not hard to put together. And a recent California study of 4,000 visitors to ride drive events showed that an amazing 98% say that they're they plan to buy or they have already bought an electric vehicle. And there are plenty of other resources. Take the time to do the short or long form global footprint assessment. The best short uh, form is the gold standard. Our partner Bright Action does an excellent and detailed assessment. If you go to Bright Action and input your zip code, you'll access local assessments with potentially 50 to 75 suggested actions that you and your club can take. And by the way, you can work in your club and set up a group that will be tracked. That's worthwhile and worth considering. And businesses and organizations can seek green certification based on UN Sustainable Development Goals or through a myriad of green certification programs in almost every county, every part of the United States and every country. There are no ones that is the best each one uh, needs to be looked at based on your local community. And consider being responsible when you travel, whether for business or pleasure. I won't go into these services, but, but thoughtful travel is important, not just offsets, but making sure that the money you spend is spent at your destination rather than with global travel vendors. We can overcome resistance by deciding on our focus, maintain the existing model or move to a new paradigm. There are numerous cultural and political direct, uh, directions worth considering. The United Nations push for sustainable development. Actions like the Assisi Manifesto where the climate change is an opportunity to address global in inequality. The Pope has come out with an encyclical recently and it addresses inequality with a balanced thoughtful development. And it's 17 pages long and it's fascinating to read. No matter the exact details, green legislation is a must in the near future. We're in the midst of a crisis. We have, to, we have to really move fast. Most important of all, make sure that your voice is heard around legislative action. 
The Citizens Climate Lobby is in the forefront of legislative action to address pollution in the United States and is now beginning to partner with Rotary. And there are plenty of other groups taking action and looking for support. Take a look at all the programs, give your time and your energy. And just uh, may I point out, the Rotary International Convention is just completing tomorrow and both RCAT and SRAG have virtual reality rooms that you can visit through the end of the month. They're fun and informative and links will be included in my email. So please take action, that's the bottom line. Sign the pledge, create an action team, become a member of SRAG so that we have strength across all of Rotary. Join the network and access our regular programs, speakers for your club, connections to other clubs and sharing your projects. But let me leave you with the words of Carl Sagan regarding our blue marble. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So as Rotarians and citizens, please use your voice, your vote, your choices in the marketplace, and your club's influence in the community as if your world depends on it because it does. Again, I'm gonna put all the notes in um, and send them off to Maria. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. If, uh, if the first one is, uh, if the world only met the Paris Accords, would that be a mitigate, mitigating strategy or an adaptive strategy? And does science suggest meeting the Paris Accords will reverse the warming trends? It will. It will lessen the problems that we have, but it will not um, reverse everything. So it limits, uh, it get, it's the first step towards addressing the adaptation and the mitigation um, because it will allow us to understand what it is that we have to do. Um, but without uh, doing some kind of restoration, without doing some kind of understanding of the natural processes that are going on when we need to naturally sequester carbon. Without doing that, um, let, me, let me just say, 93% of the heat goes into the oceans. And uh, if you have watched what's happening in uh, the Great Barrier Reef, in the last five years, close to 90% of it has died. And it's because of acidification and heating. Um, we cannot live without the oceans. So we have to find ways in which to um, start sequestering carbon in the oceans as well as in our soils. Um, you did, did you know that right now the biggest farm owner in the country is Bill Gates? He believes that there's processes for, um, for um, renewing the soil that farmers need to pursue. And so he has taken action to buy up land and start uh, those farmers um, getting back to the natural sequestration process. I'm not sure that answered your question. Um, there may be a follow on to that if you uh, would like to hang around towards the end here sure. uh, after we finish up the rest of the meeting. I do have one other question though, and that's that's this one it says, what's your opinion on Dr. Joe Bastardi's work on this topic? I don't know the name. Tell me what the work is and I'll tell you what my <laughs> is. Okay. 
that's all I got is the question. I don't know the, the nature of the work. So we'll leave it at that. There, there are a lot of people doing a lot of wonderful things. Um, and if you go to uh, the International Convention, you'll see a lot of people doing fabulous work. What we need to do is find ways in which to do it together. Our focus is on getting Rotary Clubs to work together, to share what they're doing and find ways in which to do it more effectively by working together. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you for a great presentation today, very informative. In honor of your presentation today, we're making a donation uh, in your honor to Harvest Against Hunger, which provides 1,500 pounds of fresh uh, produce uh, to a local food banks. So thank you again for joining us today for the Rotary meeting.